All right. We're going to get started now that you've enjoyed that. <laughs> Let's pray and we will begin. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for our Lord Jesus. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Father, we've gathered here tonight because we want to be stronger in our marriages, in our commitment, in our covenant, one to another and to you. So God, we seek to put you first in our lives. We seek to honor you. We seek to understand you more and to glorify you. And may that uh, understanding, that knowledge, that grace abound in our lives and be seen and bear fruit in our marriages. We ask now for your blessings upon uh, the teaching from Pastor Mike this evening. And uh, Lord, just grant us strength and courage to be a people of faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've asked Pastor Mike, as you've already probably figured out, to come and teach. So, Brother Mike, come and teach. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to need some help with some Bible verses. So if someone will look up Mark chapter 10 and um, verses... Uh, Probably three, three through eight. We're going to start there, and then uh, I need someone to look up James chapter four, verses one through three. Who's got that? James four, one through three. We'll see that in a minute, okay, brother? Thank you. And um, then we'll look up a couple others as we get into here. But I just want to start there in Mark chapter ten, beginning in verse one. If you'll go there, everybody, I just want you to see this. Because I think this is a great springboard verse to help us in Mark chapter 10. Who's got it? They want to read it. Verse 1. Anybody got it? Want to read it? Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. Go ahead, brother. Real loud. 1 through 10. 1 through 8, sorry. And said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they and they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of the divorcement, and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Thanks. In verse 9 it says, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So we can see here as Jesus was being tempted by the Pharisees about the issue of divorce because of Moses, and uh, he said it was because of the hardness of their hearts. But from the beginning it wasn't so. So God's plan is for people to be married and stay married for the rest of their lives until they go home to be with the Lord. And so it's unique in that God says that two shall become one flesh. That's not only talking about sexual intimacy, it's talking about oneness. And God is all for oneness. And so if you look at this, we know that Satan isn't for oneness. He's for two-ness, as my Bible class students say. Okay? Um, he's for division. And so God's desire for married couples is oneness. And God takes a, a man and a woman, living two distinct individual lives, brings them together in marriage, hence to become one flesh. When you got married, everything changes. No dividing up, nothing faced alone. Start thinking as one, tackling every problem as one, taking care of each other as one. It means you care about your spouse as much as you care about yourself because the two of you are now one. No longer was it Mike and Louise when we got married, it was Micah Louise. And so therefore we need to um, quit thinking as two and trying to live separate lives within our marriage. We need to be living as one. What do we want? What do we think? What do we care? What are we feeling? Instead of what am I feeling? What are you feeling? It needs to be addressed as one because that's how God designed it. You know, um, if, I, if I would put on one shoe and go out in the snow feeling smug and thinking that one foot was covered and warm and not care about the other foot, 
uh, it's like what many couples do. They selfishly live a divided married life unconcerned about their quote-unquote other foot. And they don't care less. They just keep going down the path and everything's okay. And who cares what they think? I got everything I, I want and everything I think. And so it doesn't matter. So again, this oneness uh, is a, so important. And under Jesus' teaching, divorce here isn't you know, what it is. It isn't an amputation of a relationship. It's a death. Because when you separate one, as one, it becomes a death. That's why it's a grounds for a divorce. Okay? Um, death is a grounds for a divorce because two are split and they're no longer together. It's one. And so it's so unbelievable that so many people live in, in such a way that there's no marital intimacy and there's no closeness and there's no oneness with them. And so what happens if they refuse to continue to get together, they become separated, so to speak, and they need, what they need is they need to be reborn as a couple and realize that oneness still exists and needs to exist in their marriage. In Mark chapter 3, verse 25, don't turn there, the Bible says, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. The greatest military attack is to divide and conquer. And so, what makes you think that Satan isn't trying to do that in our homes, in our lives? Because again, someone once said, as goes the home, so goes the church. And so if you de determine to live a split life in your home, it can cause a havoc, in, havoc in your home, but it also begins to cause havoc within the church. And of course, then the world goes to hell because the Christians are messed up and no one's out there telling others about Jesus. So it's a great attack by the devil to try to destroy our homes. And so um, conflict and how it is resolved is so important and, and not resolving the conflict can bring a lot of division in a home. And tonight I want to help you understand the different ways to handle conflict and to determine the best way that you can handle conflict within your marriage. And uh, I think it's so important. Everybody has conflict. Can somebody give me an example of what uh, couples may have conflict about? Give me an example. Money. Money. Kids? Dinner. Dinner. Where are we going to eat tonight? Okay. That's why I like smorgasbords like tonight. You know, you can just get it whatever. Okay. What other conflicts can you have in a marriage? What TV show to watch? Okay. Which side of the bed to sleep on? What side the toilet paper is rolled over on? I have a list here, okay? <laughs> Um, think of some of these differences between the two of you. Are they a potential for conflict? One is the bottom of the toothpaste tube squeezer, and the other squeezes from the top. One wants the toilet paper roll from the top of the roll, and the other wants it rolled from the bottom. How many of you are over the top rolled toilet papers? How many underneath rolled toilet papers? Oh, <laughs> see, we have a conflict tonight, folks. <laughs> One's body temperature cries for the thermostat to be set at 78 degrees, and the other is constantly flinging open the window. Okay? When they speak, one gives an entire novel length story, and the other gives a two line news commentary. Okay? One is a night person, the other is a morning person. One wants the room absolutely dark for sleeping, the other wants a light on. One feels that making love belongs only in the bedroom, in the dark, and under the covers, but the other likes variety and is, is quite in, inventive. One tosses and hangs the clothes wherever he feels led, and the other has the clothes color-coded on hangers a half an inch apart. <laughs> One likes to arrive 15 minutes late, and the other 15 minutes early. Hence, you have conflict, okay? I mean, let's look at some of the definitions I have of conflict, okay? Conflict, um, the definition, a fight, a clash, it's contention, sharp disagreement, opposition of interests and ideas. Uh, and again, there's other things up here. Um, to be in opposition, a struggling with difficulties, a striving to overcome the differences. And that's a big conflict as it is, understanding the differences between men and women, and that can cause a lot of conflicts. Again, uh, some handle conflict differently, some handle it by suppressing it, and they just retreat and go into their cave, so to speak, and others express it really uh, unreservedly and they express it with feeling and gusto if you will and uh, they keep waving you over and over as an attack okay and again those are not the right ways of handling conference so 
But one of the things about conflict, it's not always negative. There are some things I want you to consider about conflict that may be to your benefit in a marriage, okay? The first one is conflict is natural and inevitable, okay? Uh, we as a couple are different and we perceive situations differently, which allow different opinions and choices that can cause a conflict. Verbal conflicts can be good depending on the maturity of the individuals. It can open doors of communication or it can shut them tighter than tight. And so again, how you get through those conflicts is important. Verbal conflicts uh, can be good depending on the maturity of those individuals. Number two, conflict may be an indicator of being deprived of some value or need. Maybe the person feels insecure, doesn't feel it has any worth. And so they get into conflict because they don't think their husband or, or wife are validating them. And again, every human has basic needs regarding love and feeling of self-worth. And when a conflict is, uh, uh, consider which of those needs are not being met, that may be a good idea to solve the conflict. Number three, conflict may engage, emerge as a symptom of a deeper problem. Maybe that need is unfulfilled and there's other problems going on. And so when you hear conflict, if you'll listen to the other person and let them talk through, try to figure out what they're trying to tell you, maybe it can reveal a need that they have. Maybe they uh, feel neglected or maybe they feel lonely or maybe they feel like no one cares about them. And again, they're expressing it to you, but if you just keep on going through and just pick up where the battle lies, um, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, usually conflict isn't dealt with openly and honestly. Um, everybody goes and retreats in their corner and tries to get as much ammunition to throw back at the other person without really listening to the person. And so minor conflicts are ignored for fear of rocking the boat. Major conflicts are uh, ignored because they've not learned how to deal with minor conflicts. And so therefore, why should we deal with the rest of them? Um, and again, no one's taught. Anybody teach you how to deal with conflict when you first got married? I mean, in the five chapters of the book I was handed to when I got married, none of that was how to deal with conflict. And so no one teaches you how to deal with conflict. It's just uh, the theme song becomes a Christian song, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown, okay? And that's the theme song, okay? Or the fight is on, da, 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 okay? And again, we don't learn how to do that. Um, number five, conflict provides opportunity for growth. Really, you get to hear the other person's heart, and you get to he he hear and pres what they want to present to you, and their viewpoint, you may not have considered what their viewpoint was. And so when you hear the conflict, wow, I didn't know you were feeling that, or I didn't know you were thinking that. Wow, that's a really good idea. I never thought about that. And it could help you. It could help you share the differences that you have. If you don't use them as battle zones, you can realize that, hey, you are different. And how are we going to take those two differences and blend them together? Um, you can share alternate choices. You, uh, and again, disagreements are one thing, but behaving disagreeably is quite another. And that's where the problem lies, is we don't handle it properly. Then number six, I have unresolved conflicts interfere with growth in a satisfying relationship. When you bury things, okay, um, you don't deal with them, therefore it causes you to go distant with each other. Because you're not sharing as one. You're just ignoring or running away from, and you're getting to the place where um, maybe you erect a barrier to protect yourself. I'm not going to let them know how I'm truly feeling because after all, they may laugh at me or they may mock me or whatever the case may be. And again, the other uh, position that's not right is you become defensive. And when you're defensive, anything that the other person tells you, you're trying to defend against or protect what you're feeling or thinking, and it can cause a lot of problems. So what I'm going to show you tonight are five different ways you can handle conflict. And uh, we're going to show you this in this chart. Um, is You have it in your, in your notes. Okay, There's a plus side for the relationship on the very top. There's a minus side for the relationship that's a negative. Then there's a plus uh, in, in results to the right. And there's a negative in results to the left. And so wherever the quadrant is that these different things um, fall into, that helps you to know what you're dealing with and what's going on. 
The first one I want to deal with is withdraw. And I'd like somebody to look up Acts 15, verse 39. Who will do that for me? Acts 15, 39. And someone else can look up Proverbs, two, uh, uh, Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Who's got Philippians 2 and 3 and 4? Mike, good. thank you. And uh, I need someone to look up Proverbs 13, 10. Who's got Proverbs 13, 10? Thanks, Brother Bob. And then uh, Amos 3, 3. Very well quoted book of the Bible. Amos 3 3. Okay, if you know where to find it, all right? <laughs> or I call it Amos. Okay, Amos 3 3. Okay. All right, who's got that one? Anybody got Amos 3 3? Thank you. All right. So let's look at Acts 15, verse 39. What's it say? Oh, was it me? Yeah, Go ahead, said. brother. Oh, I didn't. I didn't think it was me. Okay. What? What was the verse? I'm sorry. 1539, Acts 1539. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barabbas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. So there's a problem between Paul and Barnabas and John, Mark, and Silas. And um, they never dealt with it. They just departed. They withdrew. So the first thing we're going to talk about is withdraw. This is the number one thing that most people go to when they're having a conflict. And you'll notice that it's a double negative. Um, the withdrawal has no result, okay? Nothing gets accomplished in it, okay? You know, why does not nothing get accomplished? You're not confronting, you don't talk about it, you don't deal with it, okay? And then uh, why is it a minus for the relationship? Saying it's still hanging over your head, you've not resolved the conflict, and so therefore you're just ignoring it and running away from it, which doesn't solve it. And you notice in Acts chapter 15 there, they didn't solve the problem, they just left each other. And it caused more problems because they just left it and they were gone. And so in withdraw, my, my famous quote for withdraw is, when the going gets tough, the tough run. When the going gets tough, the tough run. I married a couple and about, they were married about six months and I heard that they were getting a divorce after being married for six months. And so I went to them and said, what seems to be the problem? And the guy said, I'm so frustrated that I can't deal with this anymore. I said, why? He said, anytime there's anything I bring up that looks like it might become a conflict, she goes in the bedroom and she locks the door and won't let me in and won't talk about it. I, he, I said, well, give me an example of what you're talking about. And he goes, like, I, whether I should have enough money to pay the rg &E bill or the Frontier telephone bill. And when I go to bring it up to her, she slams the door and she won't talk about it. And it's like, oh, really? And she, he goes, yeah, she just, she doesn't want any kind of conflict at all, hates confrontation, just ignores it and runs away from it. And, uh, you know, mortgage companies and credit card companies know this to be a fact too, because when people are late on the bills, they try to call them and what do people do? They don't answer the phone, <laughs> okay? They withdraw. So what people do when they withdraw, the th case is viewed as hopeless and there's little control, so why bother with it and why not, why handle it? I call this extreme ostrich-itis. You put your head in the sand and you go, problem? I don't see a problem, what problem? There's nothing wrong, there's no conflict, okay? And again, there is a problem. Physically, maybe they leave or withdraw. Maybe they go out of the door and slam the door or get in the car and squeeze the tires because they're not gonna deal with this thing. Um, and they leave the room, leave the house. Psychologically, they may withdraw. They get quiet, they don't speak, they ignore. They insulate themselves against what is being said so it has no penetrating effect on them. That is not a good way of handling things. And again, it's not good for the relationship and it's, you don't get anything accomplished when you withdraw. So again, if you're the kind of person, and here's what I want you to do too while we're going through these. I want you to determine which is your number one go-to that you do. What do you personally do when you go through this uh, conflict 
How do you handle conflict? What's the number one way you go to? So if you're a withdrawer that you don't like a confrontation, I, I'm a peacekeeper. I don't like confrontation. And so sometimes I may get quiet and go into my man cave, okay? But it's not a good thing because nothing ever comes good out of that, okay? All right, next, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Let nothing, nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Okay, so this is yield. And you'll notice it's in the top quadrant on the left, okay? So in the result phase, Yield for the person who's yielding doesn't re have any results. It's a negative in the result area. However, in the relationship, they want to keep peace, and so it's good for the relationship because, again, they just sort of kind of let the other person have their way. They give in. You know, when you go down the, side, down the street and you see a yield sign, it's you give the right away to the other person. And so a person who yields gives the right away to their spouse or to the person. By the way, these are good not just for marriage. This is good in business. This is good in any area of your life as you deal with other people in handling different kinds of conflict. Um, it's use, uh, one, my phrase for this is get, give in to get along. We give in to get along. And so we want to keep peace, and so therefore I'm not going to go to this battle. I'll just let it happen and let it go. Now it's good at first. It looks really good. And it's used for protection against confrontation. You don't want to confront somebody else, so you just yield and give in. You don't want to argue with them. You don't want to oppose them. So you just, okay, go ahead. You know, some people use it as a, do you want to kill your marriage on this battlefield? Do you want to wait till the next major battlefield to kill it? So they just let it go. And that's good for a while, but I, it, this turns to what I call a, a martyrism or a martyr complex. The person who constantly yields begins to feel sorry for themselves and say, you know what, I always give in. I'm always letting you have your way. And pretty soon begins to churn up inside and they begin to get a little bit bitter and they begin to get upset a little bit and, and they want their day in court, so to speak. And uh, it, it also can display a false front. Well, you know, I'm being like Jesus and I'll just let you have your way. And, but in all reality, it's not really working because they're really getting upset inside and bitter. And what happens is it may result in suppressed or repressed anger. And you're building up. Anger comes from unfulfilled expectation. I expect something to happen, it doesn't happen, so I get angry. I'm driving down the expressway and the guy's on my left and I'm expecting him to stay there. All of a sudden he cuts me off and pulls in front of me, I get blessed. No, <laughs> I get angry, okay, because I expected him to stay there and he cut me off. And the same thing is true when we expect our spouse to act a certain way or do something. Uh, things we suppress our anger because it didn't happen the way we we wanted him to say no honey I want you to have your way I don't have couples in my office arguing like that pastor I want him to have his way and he wants me to have my way and I never have couples like that it's always I want my way and so again it may result in anger and again what you need to do sometimes is choose your battles wisely I agree and that's an important thing. But when you constantly give in and yield to get along, it can cause a lot of hurt feelings and anger. Okay? Can anybody think of an example like that? Where someone yields? What might they yield to? Put you on the spot a little bit. Well, what if spend the tax return check? Okay, where to spend the tax return check, okay? Bills or pleasure, okay, or vacation. And you say, well, we really need to pay bills, but uh, honey, I know I'll, I'll let you do it however you want to or whatever the case may be. You know, and again, I had one couple come to me and they, they were talking about spending their tax money and 
the guy works 60% more times than the woman works, than his wife works. And so he comes, they come to me and they say, Pastor, we think that whoever made the most ought to be able to spend the 60% and the 40% ought to be able to spend the 40% of the money of the return. And I said, um, doesn't the Bible say to become? So it's not her money and my money, it's our money. It's our vacation. It's our bills. It's our sickness. It's our whatever. It's all about oneness. And that's what keeps having problems in the home because they don't deal with it as one. Proverbs 11.1. 1. Someone read that for me. Proverbs 11.1. 1. <clears throat> They got it? False balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So this next one is called compromise. This is a Baptist preacher's worst word, okay? We don't like this word compromise, okay? And really what it is, it's a balance. But it's in the middle there, so it isn't a plus for the relationship, it isn't a negative for the relationship. It isn't a, a minus for results, and it isn't a plus for result. It just hangs there in the middle. Uh, perhaps maybe a compromise looks like this. Maybe uh, the guy works Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. The wife works Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And their complaint is they never get to spend time together. So they decide that each of them are going to take one a night and they're going to spend the time together as one night. Does that solve the problem of them not spending quality time? No, it doesn't. But at least it comes up with some solution that they could work with. That's what a compromise is. My phrase, it's a negative for result, or it's a zero for result and a zero for the relationship. And my phrase for this one is you give a little, but you also... Take a little too. You give a little, I'm going to move this, sorry. Not looking what I'm doing. You give a little, but you take a little. It's like horse trading or bartering. You're giving something, but you're also taking something. So it comes out to be a, almost like a wash, okay? Um, important to back off on some of your demands, maybe, and be able to let the other person have their way. But here's what happens in this. Um, Sometimes in compromise, a person can keep score and they can figure out that they've been giving in or giving up for a while and, and they get upset because they always let you have more than you let them have. And so again, in order to help the other person be able to live, give a little, you must give your, of yourself up and be able to allow them to have like a compromise. Can anybody think of an example of a compromise other than what I just shared with you? What's another compromise? What would be a compromise of maybe buying an, a, a car? The guy wants a truck. <laughs> the girl wants a minivan. <laughs> no. <laughs> A luxury car, a luxury car, a Camaro she wants, okay. So how do you compromise? An SUV. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Good compromise, okay. Then both of you get what you want, all right, so to speak. So again, um, it's tough sometimes to be able to compromise, and you may have to just retreat a little bit and back off of what you might demand in order to let the other person have a little this time, and then maybe able to allow the other person to have something the next time, okay? This next one is a nasty one, okay? This one is win. And uh, if you look at win, uh, Proverbs 13.10 is the verse that I'd like someone to read for me. Proverbs 13.10. Only by pride cometh contention. Yes, exactly, Brother Bob. That's true. So again, what we do in win is it's plus for the results because you get what you want, but it's a negative in the relationship because you don't care about the relationship. You don't care what the other person wants. This is what you're going to do. This is what I want. 
this will happen. After all, and this is, I hear this used, I'm the head of the house, and this is what's going to happen. And again, guys, when you have to declare that to your wife that you're the head of the house, you have failed miserably. Okay? Because again, your lovingness and your sacrifice for her and your giving of your love to her as you're commanded by God will allow her to make you the head because she wants to, not because you demand her to. And so it's so important, the phrase for this one, it's my way or the highway. You do this or else. Okay? And uh, I know people like this. They're nasty. And... Uh, you don't dare cross them because it's like dealing with a car salesman, the old kind of way you dealt with car salesmen. You know, they have to win. They have to make a profit for their company. And when you think you're going to win, you're not going to win. I remember one time when we, we went to buy a car, I think I went back to the dealership eight times. At eight different times, I get all the way back home, they call me back to come back. We'll, we'll talk a little more. And then the guy said, well, let me go talk to my boss. I didn't realize what was happening. About three days later, I had to get a part at that same dealership. And I walked by the Coke machine or the coffee machine, and the coffee machine had a sign that said, The Boss. He wasn't going back and talking to anybody. He was going back and get a cup of coffee. And so he was making decisions, and yay or nay, according to what he wanted, because he went and talked to the boss. They have to win. You're not going to win. Okay, you may get a nice discount, but you're not going to win. Um, this is a selfish, self-centered um, decision-making process. And again, like I said, you don't care what the other person wants. It's all about me, myself, and I. And that's why every contention or every problem, contention is fighting, every problem you have has the root of pride, which, by the way, is the root of sin. And if you check out the middle letter of sin and pride, what is it? I. I. Okay? And that's usually the problem. Okay? And so no matter the cost, you have to win. It's power and control. Usually because someone's self-image is threatened, so he's going to man up and, and power through this thing and get in his authority is going to win him something. And, and all of us have dealt with people like this our whole life. Maybe it's an employer that we work for or maybe it's some neighbor that you have that's, you know, Got to prove that they're, you know, God Almighty, so to speak, on earth. And the bottom line comes down to it can cause a lot of problems. Um, you know, what most of the time happens is these people consider their wants as needs. Okay? Um, we need a Camaro with the biggest engine and the biggest transmission and the biggest um, axle in the back. We need a, you mean you want a Camaro? No, we need it. Okay, And so usually they confuse those two um, and they make their wants the needs that will happen. Um, usually what happens, they take different tactics to win. Um, they usually pile, stockpile things that they know will hurt their spouse and they dredge them up and to throw against them. Well, don't complain because remember when you did this and remember when you did this, remember when you did this and I today am going to do what I want. Okay. And usually they belittle the other person. They have to make them... You know, it's interesting what people do. They think they're gaining on themselves and making themselves look better. But really what happens is they tear the other person down to make themselves look better and they never move. And they think they've won, but they really lost because they didn't gain anything. They haven't done anything because, again, they have to belittle or bully the other person to get their way. And it's pretty sad when that happens in a marriage and the poor wife sits there and cowers because the husband's constantly yelling or screaming at her and telling her what will happen and this is the way it's going to be and don't you dare tell me anything different because this is how it's going to happen. Again, uh, it can really be nasty in, in a home like that. Okay, and then the last one is Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And the last one is the most important one because this is where you resolve the problem. You solve it. Who's got Amos 3.3? 3? 
Go ahead, Cindy. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can someone look up Psalm 133, verse 1? Someone else look up Ephesians 4, verse 3? Psalm 133, verse 1. And Ephesians 4, verse 3. Who's got Psalm 133, 1? Go ahead, Brother Thomas. Okay, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. Sounds like oneness to me, right? Ephesians 4 3. Go ahead, Brother. Unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The greatest thing you could ever do in a conflict, and by the way, Conflicts, like I said, don't have to be bad. Um, it's just a disagreement. It's just one person has an opinion, another person has a different opinion, and you're going to work it through and come with, up with what's our opinion. And that's what's going to happen. So my, what you see in that one is you see a plus for results because you get what's accomplished because the two of you figure it out and you get accomplished. And then it's a plus for the relationship because you both are agreeing to what's going to happen, which is going to bring closeness and intimacy for the two of you. My phrase for this one is mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. You set out to solve something, you accomplished it and resolved the problem. A solution is reached through mutual agreement. Okay? And there's many other ingredients, we'll talk about that in a minute, that goes into this. It's an exchange of information, feelings, and ideas which bring mutual understanding. You know what the problem is? All this takes time. And we live in such a hurried, busy place that we don't take the time to work these things through with each other as a couple. And we just like throw things at each other and run. Or we give each other the leftovers at the end of the day. Isn't it sad that our most closest person in our life, our spouse, is we go give everybody else our jobs and our schools and our kids and everything else. And then all of a sudden here we are after dinner. It's like, hi, how are you? Good night, good night. <laughs> That's it, it's done. So we don't spend the time to work through and feel and get the understandings and the feelings and having mutual understanding. Resolving accomplishes oneness, which I term as intimacy. Oneness and intimacy are one and the same. Intimacy is not sex. Intimacy is the oneness and the closeness that both of you feel, okay, which may result in having sex. But the bottom line is, is your intimacy is so vital because it's your closeness with each other. And your relationship is made stronger when you're able to resolve the conflict. And I've heard many conflicts over the years and refereed many conflicts from people. And some of these points that I bring up to them about, you know, have you ever considered that this is our relationship? Or this is our struggle? And, and maybe, you know, one of the other spouses says, no, it's your struggle. Well, if two are one, your struggle is my struggle. It's our struggle. And if someone's sick in your family, and maybe they have some sickness, disease, cancer, whatever the case may be, it's not her sickness, it's our sickness. Because we're one. And we don't think about that. We just continue. I'm reading this book right now. Um, it's just got me really, really thinking about a lot of things about oneness and, and uh, blessing my spouse and where we think about the other person and esteem them better than ourselves. And so rather than challenge them, argue with them, confront them, whatever, it's how can I bless them? How can I be a blessing to them and make them better than myself? Well, what are some of the ingredients to resolve the conflict? I listed a couple things. Uh, number one, I think communication is the key. And communication isn't just talking. You know, the Bible says in James, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
God gave you two of these. And he only gave you one of these. Which means he wants you to do this twice as much as he wants you to do this. And so one of the things that I think are so important for us is to learn to listen. Guys, the number one complaint of most wives in marriage conflict is my husband never listens to me. And the husband's number, number one retort to that is, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. And he, he hears, but he doesn't hear. He's not understanding. He's just listening. Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so there's a difference between just letting it come in here and being able to really hear and try to understand. That's the third ingredient, understanding. You need to understand them when they speak and you need to understand them when you're listening to them, okay? So it's so important. Timing is crucial. You know, so many things are negated because it's a wrong time. You know, for years I worked with Pastor Grace. Some of the new guys come on staff and they want to go in and tell Pastor Grace something. I go, mm-mm-mm, I know. And they go, oh, come on. He really needs to know this. Not now, he doesn't need to know that. And they go, what are you talking about? I go, timing is everything. Right now, he's frustrated. He's got about three different things he's working on. And he's frustrated. And when you get in there, that's, your, that's his fourth. And you're going to get your head bit off. Leave it alone. Pray about it. Come back another day. They come back. Thank you very much. That was great advice, okay? Because I know the guy. I've worked with him for over 30 some odd years, okay? And the bottom line is the same thing your spouse. Timing is everything. You come in and your wife, guys, she's dealing with the kids. One just threw up. The other one just messed his pants. And she's trying to get dinner on the table. And a kid threw his SpaghettiOs all over the floor. And you come in and go, hon, I need some laundry right now. You're going to die. <laughs> You're going to die. Okay? Timing is everything. Or she's in the middle of all that and you sneak, sneak up to her. Hi, babe. How's it going? She wants to kill you. She wants to put a knife through your face. Okay? The bottom line comes down to timing is everything. You need to bring things up and take things and work them through the conflicts when you have the right time. I tell people the best thing for you to do is... Um, you may have to withdraw. You may have to withdraw, but when you do withdraw, put a time on it. Right now, hon, I'm really upset. It's not a good thing to talk about right now, but I'll tell you what, you give me two hours, we'll go to coffee at Starbucks and we'll talk about it. But if you just withdraw, then it's gonna be trouble. But if you give it a time, because the timing isn't right, then it'll help you, it'll, it'll really be helpful. Humility. Humility and other-centered thinking. Be humble. D don't try to give it, get it your way as the highway. Back off. Okay? Be humble about this and allow the other person to be able to give you their input and help them. You're thinking about the other person more than yourself. I already talked about this. Withdraw. Take a time out. Uh, you may compromise and be open to some exchange or some swapping of ideas to work things through. That'll be helpful. Be willing to be vulnerable. Be willing to be humble and admit that you might be the responsible one. You might be the one that caused the conflict and be willing to admit that. Don't barricade yourself behind, beside, behind your pride and determine that I wasn't wrong, you're always wrong, you're wrong. It ain't gonna work, okay? Never use win as a solution. Win is not a solution in this chart. Never, ever, ever. You should never tr strive to get your way or the highway. Maybe you need to try to identify some of the unresolved hot spots that you really never came to a solution of it. You just keep pushing it aside or pushing it under the table and you never deal with those things. Like something like maybe how are we gonna discipline our kids? And you have one way you want to discipline them and they have another, your spouse has a different way. And you really never really sat down and resolved that conflict. You just, 
you do it the way you do it, and she does it the way she does it, and never the twain shall meet. And your poor kids don't know where either of you are coming from because it's not a united front. It's not oneness. And so maybe you can need to sit back and let the other person um, identify some of the problems that you really haven't faced and talk about them. Okay, it's important. Then express some physical and emotional affection to reduce the tension. When I um, have couples in my office ask for forgiveness one, one of another, I have them face each other and they have to hold hands and look into each other's eyes and be able to ask for forgiveness. And it's amazing how instantly that sort of kind of just drops the pride and usually both tear up and begin to really deal from their heart with each other. Because again, they're, they're able to reach out and touch each other and be able to express some emotional affection to help ease the tension. Next, make I statements rather than you statements. I don't have this in your notes. I found this up here. Make I statements. You do this, and you do that, and you always do this, and you never do that, and you... Don't say you. You is accusatory. It's like in your face, okay? Um, I would like to see you handle this differently, and I'd be willing to help you handle it, but I think it needs to be handled. Not, you need to handle this, or you need to come up with a solution to this. Again, it will put everybody on guard and cause tension and strife in the home. Next, make sure you look inward first when solving conflict. What's my responsibility in this? What have I done? You can always point a finger at the other person. Remember, when you point a finger, you have three pointing back at yourself. Okay, I need, what have I done to cause this conflict? Or what didn't I do to cause this conflict? And again, the bottom line is, is that it, the conflict will begin to resolve itself as you put these ingredients together and pretty soon you'll be seeing how close the two of you are dealing with things as one. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Number one. Now I don't want you to do it here tonight. I just want you to write it down. <clears throat> I want you to identify one conflict you are having. Which means if you identify one and your spouse identifies a different one, then you'll be dealing with two conflicts and that's okay. Okay? Name one conflict that you're having. And I want you to find a way this week, you have one week to do it, how are we going to resolve this conflict? How are we going to resolve this conflict? Anybody else got a list of conflicts that people go through in their relationships that can cause any strife as more examples? Anybody want to give some more? Money's big. Okay? It's huge. Hmm? Scheduling, yes. That's huge too. Okay? Scheduling. Guys, remember... I had this illustration I was going to bring, and I just thought, no, I'll, I'll use it all the time. But the bottom line is, is the late guy comes home from work, and his wife is just the house an abomination. Everything's just torn apart. The kids are all running loose, and there's garbage everywhere, and there's stuff on the stove cooking. And, and he goes in, and here's his wife sitting in bed. And he goes, hon, what's going on? And she goes, well, every day you ask me what was I doing today, so I determined to show you what I was doing today. <laughs> like I was living up to your expectation of me. So she was doing absolutely nothing. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Conflict. What other conflicts could people have? Any others? You can think of. Huh? There is so many. And some are small and some are big. Conflict with the in-laws and the outlaws. Hey, that could be big. Okay? Children in school and doing homework and when they're going to do homework and, and a, a whole bunch of things. So again, take one this week. 
and work it through. Come up with you do. Pastor Kevin? Why don't you stay right here, Brother Mike? We're gonna Pastor Mike has been on staff for how long? 35 years. 35 years. He is the family pastor. He comes with a tremendous amount of uh, experience and wisdom. Um, God really has gifted him in so many ways. Uh, I thought, you know, you know, we're we're doing this couples life group. We're having our couples conference coming up because truly we do believe as the strength of the marriage goes, so does the strength of our church. And frankly, as the strength of our church goes, so does the strength of our country. Okay, it really is very important that we get this right. And uh, Pastor Mike, his sole job really is to help marriages and strengthen families. So, um, you know, I want I want you to know that he's here. Uh, if you've never uh, uh, met him or know who he is, he, he is here and he is available to counsel with us and help us and assist us. Sometimes people think when they go to see the pastor that they've messed everything up and they're, you know, it's the last straw and I have nowhere else to go and, you know, my life is just about over so I might as well try the pastor now, right? But Pastor Mike, he, he doesn't usually bite. And uh, he, really, he really loves people in a special way. I always say Pastor Mike is one of these guys that he has something, there's something different about people like him. When there is a tragedy, when there is an accident, when there is, uh, uh, you know, the proverbial house on fire, he's the guy that runs in. It's amazing. When, when these guys, when there's just certain people like that, that, you know, when, 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 when there's a car accident, when somebody's at the hospital at, at one o'clock in the morning, you know, I get a text message from him, he's already there and he's already working and loving and praying and hugging and, and uh, you know, sometimes you don't need to get in a car accident to have a meeting with Pastor Mike. Okay? Sometimes we, we need to recalibrate, sometimes we just need to talk things out and he is there for that. Okay? So, uh, you know, if you ever felt like you needed something like that, just some, 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 some more of this, if you will, Pastor Mike's available to that. You can call the church office, you can call his secretary, you can send him an email, he'd love to connect with you. And if you even later on tonight, if you want to talk with him and, and get on his schedule, or uh, just ask him some questions, see where you can go with that, he would be available for that, okay? Good. Thank you, Pastor Mike. I think we've all learned something. I love the verse in Amos chapter 3 that says, how can two walk together except they be agreed, right? And, and really that's what this is all about, coming together in mutual interest and understanding. In James chapter 1, one of my favorite texts that my wife didn't write down, but you know. <laughs> we got some conflict to work on, you know. <laughs> I'm glad he said just one each, right? I have an Excel spreadsheet that I've created for her, but, you know. <laughs> now we're in trouble, right? Give me a minute to recover from that, okay? James 1 says this in verse 22, but be ye doers the word and not hearers only, comma, deceiving your own selves. The idea here is if you're a hearer and you're not a doer, you've deceived your own self. Oftentimes we come to church, we do these things, and our church provides these things. Pastor Vinny had a message on family this morning. There's a life group tonight on for couples. We have a couples conference that's coming up at the end of next month. Listen, we are all, we're doing these things intentionally, but if you only hear these these things and you don't actually apply them and begin to do these things, you've been deceived. There's no extra value that's being added to your life, okay? For verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continuing therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You hear that part there? He that looks in there and understands and begins to do that, that's the one that gets blessed. That's the one whose lives get transformed. That's when we, our marriages really in, uh, become enjoyable. We don't just survive, but we thrive. Okay? And that's what God 
has always wanted for the covenant of marriage. That's what he wants even more today. That's not what the devil wants. He wants, to, he wants to steal the joy. He wants to divide. He wants to make a mockery of that which God has made sacred. Okay, We have an opportunity as a church. I'm, I'm, I want to promote the February 17th and 18th couple conference. If you haven't signed up, um, today is not the last day to do it. There will be uh, an extra fee if you sign up after midnight tonight. But I would encourage you to sign up today, okay, before the, the clock strikes 12, okay, you can get that discounted price. For those of you that already have signed up, I know it's uh, whatever it is, 7 o'clock, 7.30, like that, I want you to be praying even, even, even when today, even before you leave, even, uh, even tonight before you get that, for some, another family in our church that you know that has not signed up, maybe call them when you get home tonight. Encourage them to sign up, okay? Take away excuses for people. Help them. You know, if they say the $100 is too much, much, ask them what they could afford. If they say, well, I could do 70 or I could do 65, then you, you pay the 30. And if you can't, I will. Okay? Let's, let's, as a church, come together and really make this a, a, a time of transformation in our church. Okay, I, every person that signed up has gotten an email from me asking that you would be praying for somebody, that you would be inviting somebody. Listen, those, that, that's not just something I'm, I'm sending out as an email to you. I want you to really be praying for other people. The body of Christ is supposed to be building each other up, holding each other up, encouraging one another. You can do it, Dan. You can do it, Dave. We can do this together, okay? That's the body of Christ. Out in the world, we're islands, right? We get beat up, we get thrashed, but in the church is when we get our strength and get that fire and that love and that nourishment that we need to really thrive if we would strive to do this together. You all following me here tonight? Okay, so I'm asking you, if you haven't signed up, that you do that today. Okay, you can do it tonight. Rick Grape is still available. Um, uh, I think the Oaktons were available. Okay, Dick Ferris is available. Uh, all able to help you sign up. If you need help online, we can ask you how, we can show you how to do that online. Uh, we, can, we can show you how to do that on paper. Uh, you know, if you, if you wait until after today, the prices do go up a little bit. Okay, so, uh, and if there's people that you know of, send them a text. Give them a phone call. Send them an email. Let's get people involved in this whole thing so that we really can be a stronger church, a stronger people together, all right? Go home and do your assignments. Work on your conflict resolution. All right, let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful that you are a God of reconciliation. You're a God that loves us, has given to us forgiveness and mercy and grace. And Lord, I pray we would take the things that you have given to us and we would use them in our own covenant relationship. Lord, I'm thankful for the people that have come out here tonight. I'm thankful for those that are desiring to come to the couples conference. That, uh, Lord, I pray for those that are not sure or unable to afford it or their schedules are complex. Lord, I pray that you would remove barriers. Lord, I pray that you would make the way straight. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would supply the needs. And God, that this would be a time of absolute transformation in our lives. God, uphold us with the right hand of your righteousness. We confess, as Solomon did, that we hardly know how to go out or how to come in. So, Lord, we ask for wisdom that truly is from above. And, God, as we receive that wisdom, help us to have the discernment and the courage and the faith to use that and to be a people wholly transformed that resemble you. Lord, that people, when they would see us, they would see literally the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us now as we go forth from this place. May we enjoy some fellowship, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Before you go... I also want you to know that the marriage conference, the couples conference, is also a kind of a uh, discipleship conference. Okay, Jesus said to go out and make disciples. He didn't say go out and have conferences, right? So the conference, really the idea behind it is we come together as a church, but afterwards, Pastor Mike and Pastor Vinny, they have been working on some discipleship, marital discipleship lessons. So after the conference is over, we're going to begin to pair up couples with other couples. 
Okay, in a discipleship model in which we come together and we begin to intimately work through some lessons and become very real one with another. Okay, that's very important for the next step. A lot of the conferences that we've done in the past have been great. The men's conference, great. Uh, the women's conference, great. What happens is a lot of times these conferences we get this spiritual high and it lasts for a week or two weeks or if you're real good a month and then we... We fall off a cliff and sometimes because we were so energized and so excited about what happened at that conference, we can actually fall lower than where we were when we started the conference. But through discipleship, what happens is that discipleship allows us to settle back down to a, a, a plane of normalcy uh, higher than where we were because it's now taken us to a, a greater level of maturity and grace and knowledge as we do this whole thing together, okay? Also, uh, before I forget, Rick has a, uh, um, a bowl in the back or something like that for the... Um, it's an offering plate. I was like, it does look like an offering plate. Uh, we're not receiving tithes and offerings, although we would receive them if you want to. Anybody want to give an extra? Just kidding. Um, it's for the babysitters, right, okay? So if you have a child, um, I think it's the first hour is free. After that, it's $50, something like that, okay? So uh, if everybody would give a little bit, we could be a blessing to the teenagers tonight. One of the things I forgot to do is you need to identify which way do you handle conflict most often and then ask your spouse if she or he agrees that that's how you handle conflict. So you need to converse with each other and, and make sure and then both of you resolve to be able to handle and resolve the conflict, okay? Love you, appreciate you. You're dismissed? Yeah, you are dismissed, or you can certainly spend some time in fellowship, talking, and enjoying each other. Thank you.